رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salamun ala ibadihi alladhi nastafa la siyama al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira my dear beloved viewers, today, inshallah, today's episode is number 699 in the series of Riyadh al-Salihin by Imam Yahya ibn Sharaf al-Nawawi. May Allah have mercy on him. And uh, today we'll begin a new chapter, chapter number 350, Babu Tahrim al-Shafa'ati fil hudud the prohibition of intercession in respect of the law and order, the punishment which is set by Allah the Almighty in the Quran for certain major crimes. Al uh, Imam Yahya ibn Sharaf al Nawawi rahmatullah alayhi have listed in this chapter one hadith and one ayah. And both are very satisfactory in this regard. Let me just confirm before we discuss that it is not permissible to intercede concerning the law and order and applying the set punishment. This is if the case have reached the court or is presented before the judge or the authorities. But before that, a person may pardon if he's been wronged or if a person has seen something wrong which is not affecting others he can turn a blind eye in order to pardon and conceal the sins of others. He can also pardon if the sin is pertaining himself or his property. But once the case is presented before the court in Islam, no one has a right to intercede. And that also means the lawyers, the lawyers, when a case is presented to you so that you can defend it in a courthouse, before the judge would look into the case, you're a judge yourself. So if you know that person is a sinner or a perpetrator and he is blameworthy, don't take the case. Because you will be defending a person whom you know that the defendant is criminal or blameworthy and his case is already presented before the court. So let him receive the adequate punishment. بالمثالية تضح المقال ونجيب examples uh, the picture will get clearer and clearer. The ayah that Al Imam Yahya ibn Sharaf al Nawawi listed in the chapter is uh, number two of Surah Al Nur, chapter number twenty four, in which Allah the Almighty says, "الزانية والزاني فجلدوا كل واحد منهما مئة جلدة ولا تأخذكم بهما رأفة في دين الله ولا تأخذكم بهما رأفة في دين الله إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر and it means الزانية the adulteress الزاني the adulterer so the man and the woman who guilty of committing fornication. Their punishment to flog each one of them with a hundred lashes. And meanwhile, don't you feel pity to the extent that you would waive the punishment or withhold the hukm, the law of Allah the Almighty from being practiced. إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر 
if you truly believe in Allah, if you truly believe in the hereafter, the day of reckoning, the day of accountability, then you should fear Allah and you should understand that whenever a sin which incurs a punishment, then it must be applied once the case is presented before the court and all the articles confirm that this uh, person is a perpetrator or a guilty of this sin and deserves this punishment. So no one should pick up the phone and say, Sir, to the chief judge, you know, the guy who was caught yesterday drinking, he's actually my cousin. So is there a way that we can waive the flogging, the punishment? Either way, it doesn't matter what kind of punishment. Even in today's world and today's uh, courthouse and laws and punishments, it is not permissible when the person is proven guilty of a sin to intervene, to intercede or to interfere in order to waive the punishment or make it lighter. That is not permissible. And we say the word hudud is plural and it's single. It's singular, is had. Had is a boundary, borderline. So Allah the Almighty says, وَتِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ فَلَا تَعْتَدُوهَا وَمَنْ يَتَعَدَّ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ ظَلَمَ نَفْسَهِ Those are the boundaries of Allah. Do not cross them. Do not even come close to them. And whoever crosses those red lines, the boundaries which are set by Allah has indeed wronged himself or herself. Accordingly, Allah the Almighty revealed in the Quran certain punishment for certain major sins. For adultery, Allah says in this ayah, both as zaniya to a zani, a hundred lashes each. And he said, لا تأخذكم بهما رأفة في دين الله Let not pity withhold you in their case or, you know, persuade you not to apply the punishment on them because he is a son of so and so or she is a daughter of so and so. And obviously this is a punishment for a couple who practice adultery knowingly, no confusion, no doubts. And meanwhile, they never been married before because the punishment for adultery in case of marriage is way severer. It is, as you know, the capital punishment. And to confirm that this person is guilty of this crime of adultery, it requires four male witnesses. And they should be just, not any witness, honest, trustworthy. And when they testify, four of them will be singled out on a side and they will be questioned. What did you see? So all of them, their statement and testimony should be identical. I have seen such and such person and we recognize his face on him very well. And he was having intercourse with such and such person. Oh, so it is not sufficient to say we've seen him hugging. And they were even in the nude. No, because this is not sufficient. In order to deliver a testimony, Allah made it so difficult. Yes, so that no one would just appear and say, I have seen this person committing adultery. Also for another reason. So no one would be taken to the court for adultery unless if a person was doing this in public or was so careless he didn't care who was watching him to have four people for grown up adults, Muslims, just honest, trustworthy, and they happen to see the whole thing with complete intercourse, not just having kissing and hugging, and witnessing that, then this person is cruel, this person is really bad, and he deserves the punishment. A normal person, when he is uh, somebody is walking around or moving, they will shy off, they will cover up, they will run off, they will apologize. But a person who is insisted on doing so, that's why the punishment is very severe. Throughout the life of the Prophet وسلم, almost about four cases only of hudud. And we know about two of them, uh, a person by the name Ma'iz 
and another person by the name Maaz al Aslami, and uh, another person, a woman by the name uh, the Ramidiya woman, without mentioning her name. And in both cases, they came to spy in against themselves. They admitted, they confessed their sins in order to be purified. And both of them, even though they never met, but the catch that it was first Ma'iz who comes to the Messenger of Allah and says, O oh, Prophet of Allah, purify me. I've committed a major sin and need to be purified. Because in Islam, the punishment is a means of purification. And the punishment according to uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib and also the hadith of Ubad ibn al-Samit and it is a sound hadith. فَمَنْ أَصَابَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ شَيْئًا فَعُوقِبَ بِهِ فَهُوَ كَفَّارَةُ الله. Whoever indulges into any of the major sins which were forbidden in the bay'ah, uh, killing, committing adultery, false accusation, uh, uh, accusing false, falsely accusing just men and women, uh, and so on. So if a person, if a person indulged into any of these sins and he was caught, or he or she confess their sins and they receive the adequate punishment, the Almighty Allah will not punish them again in the hereafter. According to Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ أَكْرَمَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ أَكْرَمَ مِنْ أَنْ يُثَنِّيَ الْعُقُوبَةَ عَلَى عَبْدِهِ مَرَّتَيْنِ Allah is most generous. He punished us. He may reward twice, thrice, quadrate, so many times for the same deed, no problem. But to punish twice for the same sin, no, Allah is most generous, Allah is most merciful. So that's why Imam, uh, Imam Ali, Amir al-Mu'mineen, may Allah be pleased with him, perceived al-hudud as jawabir, not just zawajir. Zawajir, yani the law, the, the Almighty Allah set the severe punishment for committing uh, the major sins, according to him, they're not only to ward of people from committing the sins or indulging into them, but also in case that a Muslim indulged into any of these sins and they were punished. So the punishment, the adequate had or punishment is sufficient as means of expiation. And that means the person will not be re-punished again in the hereafter for the same sin. And this is from the mercy of the Almighty Allah. So, it happened once in the following hadith, hadith number 1770. It's a sound hadith and agreed upon its authenticity. Aisha Umm Mu'mineen radiallahu anha. And the hadith, by the way, is narrated by many other companions. But here the current narration is narrated by Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha Anna Qurayshan ahammahum sha'nu al-mar'at al-maghzumiyya al-lati sarakat Faqalu man yukallimu fiha rasool Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Faqalu wa man yajtari'u alayhi illa usamat ibn Zayd Hibbu rasool Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Fakallamahu usama فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أتشفع في حد من حدود الله تعالى ثم قام فاختطبا ثم قال إنما أهلك الذين قبلكم أنهم كانوا إذا سرق فيهم الشريف تركوا وإذا سرق فيهم الضعيف أقاموا عليه الحد وأيم الله لو أن فاطمة بنت محمد سرقت لقطعت يدها متفق عليه In another narration فتلون وجه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال أتشفع في حد من حدود الله فقال أسامة استغفر لي يا رسول الله قال ثم أمر بتلك المرأة فقطعت يدها so here, Umm al Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, narrated that once Quraysh were very anxious 
and worried about a woman from Bani Mahzum. This woman have committed theft. So Quraysh were wondering if anyone can talk to the Prophet ﷺ about this woman because she's from a very prestigious family and from Bani Mahzum and it will be a, a, a shame for the whole family and defaming them. So they said, and who would be better than Usama? Who's Usama? Usama ibn Zayd is the most beloved to the Prophet and his father was his most beloved as well. As you all know that he had adopted Usama's father, Zayd ibn Haritha. And they used to call him Zayd ibn Muhammad. And they called him Hibbu Rasulillah. He is like, you know, the man whom the Prophet loves most. And his son has become Hibbu Rasulillah. وَابْنُ حِبِّ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ He has become like his father, most beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. Said, finally found him. That's Usama. He is the best person to speak to the Prophet ﷺ. He loves him so much. He may convince him to waive the punishment. What was the punishment? Cutting her hand off from the rest, the right hand. Why? Because she committed theft. And it was something valuable. So Usama radiallahu an doesn't know that it is haram to intercede concerning the hudud, the punishment which is set by Allah. So he went to the Prophet sallallahu and said, Ya Rasulullah, about this woman from Bani Makhzum, as you know her family and uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam did let him finish. And he was very angry with Usama, whom he loves most. And he said, أَتَشْفَعُ فِي حَدِّ مِنْ حُدُودِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى how dare you intercede regarding one of the punishment prescribed by Allah, O oh, Usama. Uh, Usama started panicking. The Prophet ﷺ didn't satisfy with that. Rather, he got up and he started deliver, delivering a speech, a sermon. And he said in it, Indeed, what destroyed the people before you, referring to Bani Israel was just that whenever a person of a high rank among them committed theft, they spared them. Oh, he's so and so, and his uncle, and his dad, and his grandfather, and, uh, and his laws. But if the same crime was committed by an ordinary person, they definitely inflicted the prescribed punishment on him. Yani they threw the book at him. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I swear by Allah, that if even Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad وسلم, should steal, I would have had her hand cut off. Yani, uh, and Nabi وسلم, did not exclude anyone for any status. Whoever is involved in a crime that incurs the punishment, which is set by Allah, once the case is presented before the Prophet وسلم, that's it. There is only one case which if the person went willingly and he admitted, like in the case of uh, Ma'iz, no one have seen him. So he went to the Prophet وسلم, and he admitted, he confessed his sin. And the Nabi وسلم, is trying to word him off and says, Ya yeah, Ma'iz, maybe he just kissed, maybe he just hugged, maybe he just cuddled. And every time he says, no, I've done Zina. So when he comes to the Prophet ﷺ from his right side, he turns away from him and he looks in the opposite direction. So Ma'iz turns around and he faces him and said, Ya Rasulullah, purify me because I've committed adultery. Back and forth until he testified and he confessed his sin four times. Why four times? Equivalent to the four witnesses. At that, and Nabi ﷺ said, okay, punish him. When he was being punished, he ran off. But they chased them and they finished them. So the Nabi Wasallam said, you should have let him. Because if a person have confessed the sin himself and he didn't bear the punishment and he changed his view, then you should let him go. Okay? And if there is any doubt, like, oh my God, I didn't know. Wallahi, I thought it's my abaa. Subhanallah, his purse is like my purse. Exactly, I took it home and I have no clue. And also look at the history of the person. Allah doesn't, Allah the Almighty doesn't, doesn't expose somebody who's doing this for the first time. No way. 
doesn't expose a beginner. Nor does he expose a person who's doing this because he was in dire need to eat or for treatment. He exposes a person who's used to this perpetration and this evil act. Khalas, he gave him chances after chances. Now it's time to be cut and to be purified. Let's sort it out this way. Not just punished, but rather to be purified. So the Prophet Sallallahu forbade Usama and he was angry with him to the extent Usama later on said, Ya Rasulullah, seek forgiveness for my sin of trying to intercede for a sinner. And the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi ordered this woman to be punished. And when the punishment was carried out, she lost her right wrist, her hand. Later on she repented and she repented sincerely. And she was a righteous woman and she got, it, she got married from one of the Sahaba. And she used to visit Aisha radiyallahu anha and would ask her questions to present them to the Prophet sallallahu and she would do so on her behalf and then deliver the answer of the Messenger of Allah to her. Oh, so after committing the sin and receiving the punishment, go ahead and resume your life as regular. And the entire Ummah should treat you as a regular and a normal person because you receive the adequate punishment except the sin of Al-Qadhf. الذين يرمون المحصنات ثم المؤمنات ثم لم يأتوا بأربعة شهداء فاجلدوهم ثمانين جلدة So flood them eighty lashes ولا تقبلوا لهم شهادة أبدا and never accept their testimony وأولئك هم الفاسقون So later on even after they are punished we don't seek their شهادة even in a wedding contract because they proven not to be reliable, not to be credible, rather because they delivered a false testimony and they falsely accused a chaste men or women with an evil act of adultery. Somebody would say, why did the Prophet ﷺ bring the name of Fatima, his daughter? Fatima radiallahu anha was the Prophet's most beloved and she was his sweetheart, the closest to his heart. And the Nabi ﷺ mentioned about her merits many a hadith. Fatima, the mother of Al-Hasan wal Hussein, he said she's piece of me and I'm a piece of her. Radiallahu anha. So when the Prophet ﷺ says, by Allah, even if the person who committed theft happened to be Fatima bint Muhammad, not Fatima bint Makhzum. Fatima bint Makhzum, that was the name of the woman who committed theft. So her name was Fatima as well. He said, guess what? Not only if she's Fatima bint Makhzum, which is an honorable family and a noble tribe, Wallahi, even if she's Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad would have been the first to carry out the punishment. Also, I'd like to bring to your attention that the Prophet sallallahu used not to carry out the punishment by himself, but he used to send people to execute the punishment of Allah. And now we know why is it called had. Stop it right there. Because if you cross this had, you will be punished. You will deserve this severe punishment. And when the law was practiced and applied, so there was a law and order, the community was pure. Very rare cases of theft. But when the law is lenient and you can get out and get away and maneuver if you have a good lawyer, even in a country like the States, in New York, going back uh, to my house from work, if it is 8, 9 p.m., you got to be very extra cautious. Don't carry wallets, laptops, uh, earphones, or valuable stuff because right away one of these kids will stick you up with a knife, with a gun, with a nine millimeter, with a shotgun, and say, give me what you have. Can you imagine that? You gotta keep in your pocket about 20 bucks, spare 20 bucks all the time in case that if somebody sticks you up and say, give me what you have, you have to give him something or he might get angry at you and shoot you to death for 20 bucks, even for less. So why this is happening? With all the surveillance cameras and and this is in America, it is happening because such people know that they can get away with their crimes and they can spend some time in jail and will come back and to resume. 
But Allah the Almighty says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, والسارق والسارقة فاقطعوا أيديهما جزاء بما كسبا نكالا من الله والله عزيز حكيم. So this is a set punishment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know when this punishment is really applied, a lot of high ranking officers would lose their hands. A lot of emirs and princes, leaders and governors are more deserving than anyone else to cut off their hands and even their necks. When the law and order of the theft punishment is right, uh, the wealth of the ummah will belong to the ummah. People would really prosper. There would be a state of security. Now, they kidnap girls, women, children uh, in order to take a ransom or they kill the child or they rape the woman. Why is this happening? Because the law is very lenient and it is not really practiced properly. And there are fake lawyers and there are dishonest lawyers and dishonest judges. You bribe them, you get away with your crime. So when the law and order is set, straight and it is practiced as the time of the prophet and the companions then the cases will be just a handful of cases you know some people are like that and they repent and they came by themselves admitting their sins and asking Allah for forgiveness and seeking purification the punishment is severe uh, Safwan ibn Umayyah when he was uh, finished uh, performing tawaf he had a burda an outer garment it was worth 30 dirham. 30 dirham is the price of one gram of gold. It's like $50. Yeah, $55, $60, one gram of gold. He was lying down and he kept his outer garment. He made it like a pillow and somebody picked it up. So he was caught. So Safwan ibn Umayyah was still new to Islam. He brought him to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, this guy stole my burda uh, when I was asleep. So he asked him, did you steal his burda? He admitted. He said, yes, I did. So he ordered to be taken and to be punished. When Safwan ibn Umayyah learned the punishment would be cutting off his hand from the rest, his right hand, he said, oh, no, 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 I didn't mean that. I don't want his hand to be cut off uh, because of a burda or a ba'a. A clock, it's a gift, take it. He said, you should have done that before the case is brought to me. Once the case is brought to the court, then even the plaintiff doesn't have the right to pardon. Because there is a part of it which is haqqullah, the right of Allah, which he has forbidden theft and forbidden stealing. So even if you pardon, you want to pardon, it should be done before the case is presented before the court. You made a deal with the thief and you said, okay, you return everything and I will pardon you. No problem. You can do that. An intercession also before the case is brought to court, it's okay. Once the case is presented before the court or with the emir or with the judge or with the uh, ruler, no one has the right to intercede. No connections whatsoever. This has become purely the haqq and the right of Allah the Almighty. So now, brothers and sisters, it is time to take a short break. And we'll be back, inshallah, in a few minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome back. My dear viewers, you have a list of phone numbers which if you're interested to present any question in segment, please dial any of the following numbers. And we have some callers on the line. Let's begin with Abdullah from Emirates. Assalamu alaikum, Abdullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah, Sheikh. Um, my 28-year-old niece is married. Every time a proposal is identified that boy prays five times and the basic criteria is met, she makes contact with the boy using a fake profile, using social media like Facebook or Instagram, 
and tries to check if the boy, how the boy behaves with the fake profile girl. Based on this, my niece rejects the proposal if the boy, you know, wants to meet the girl or check out more photos, stating that this person's akhlaq is not good. Is this an acceptable method to check a boy's character prior to marriage, Sheikh? Please advise. Thank you, Abdullah. I mean, your niece is really smart. And I pray to the Almighty Allah and ask Him to make it easy for her to find uh, the best life may ever, the most righteous, and to grant them goodly offspring. We all know that the Prophet ﷺ said, Whom shall we accept his proposal and not turn it down? Man tardawna deenahu wa amanatahu. A deen is what you mentioned earlier. MashaAllah, the boy prays five times a day. Al-akhlaq is presented in the form of amana. When he said amanatahu, he is honest, he is genuine, he is uh, trustworthy. So the father, the brother, the guardian have all the right to investigate, to go to the neighborhood, to his workplace, if he's in school, and to test him to see whether he is truly genuine or not. And uh, what your niece have done, I mean, it never crossed my mind before, but it's very smart. I don't blame her. This is not a matter of halal and haram. This is a matter of a smart girl who really wants to verify whether the person who's proposing to her is actually somebody who's genuine, who's a faker. Because of that, I don't blame her. And I don't think she's done something wrong. Do I advise the girls to do the same? I'm, I'm not in the position of giving such advice. But I definitely do not blame your niece for what she's doing in order to verify. Especially, you said that she found out the person or persons who seem to be very religious, in fact, they are not. And they're willing to check out more photos of the girl or the chick who is trying to connect with him. May Allah guide all of us to what is best. Thank you, Abdullah, and greeting to your niece. Assalamu alaikum. This takes Sumaya from the UK. Sister Sumaya, how can I help you? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. As Go ahead. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. My first question is in Tahashud, after reciting a tahiyat, can the and sending blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Can you say a dua that's mentioned in the Quran? Can you recite a dua that is stated in the Quran, correct? Yeah. Okay. Can you give me any example? Um, the dua of Prophet Ayub. Okay. Rabbi inni masani al-durru wa anta arhamu rahimin correct? I believe so. I'm not asking this for myself. I'm asking this on behalf of someone else. No, look, respected sister Sumaya, I've answered this question tons of times. But the reason I ask you for an example, because you said the dua of Prophet Ayyub, or the dua of Prophet Yunus, or the dua of Prophet Ibrahim, Rabbi ghfili wa li al mu'mineen. So you take from the ayah this context, which is in the form of a supplication and you supplicate it as the first person. You don't read the ayah, you don't say, وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ قَائِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ You don't recite the ayah. You don't say, I remember when Ayyub called upon his Lord and said, no, you're not reciting Quran. Because in sujood or in ruku' it is not permissible to recite Quran. But it is, it is highly recommended to supplicate, particularly in sujood. So the Quran is full of supplications which have been recited on the tongue of various messengers. Can I recite these supplications as the first person in the prayer? The answer is yes. You can do that in the prayer and outside the prayer and even in your sujood and even after the tashahud that root sharif and before making tasdeem. رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ وَاجْعَنَّا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا this is the final trait of the traits of the servants of the most beneficent in Surah Al-Furqan. When Allah started off by saying, 
وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما He is admiring and he is projecting the traits of عباد الرحمن who are praiseworthy So among their traits they, when they supplicate they say والذين يقولون You don't say والذين يقولون Rather you recite it as the first person Is this permissible? Permissible And this is what the Prophet ﷺ used to do as كان يتأول القرآن يعني when Allah revealed Surah Al-Nasr إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفره إنه كان توابا He used to do the same by saying سبحان ربي الأعلى أستغفر الله وأتوب إليه Istighfar is a supplication. Okay? So he used to turn the command or the quotation about another person into the first person. This is permissible. Thank you, respected sister. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Aisha from Gambia, welcome to Huda TV. Aisha, assalamu alaikum. Alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, sure. Yes, Sister um, Aisha from Gambia. Welcome um, to Huda TV. Go ahead. Do. What is your question? Uh, my, first, yeah, my first question is uh, using the, uh, the, the Quran app. Uh, are you required when you when on your menses to perform wudu if we are to teach or you want to recite Quran? That's the first question. The second one is... Um, a woman who is married, do she really need to find out the income that he, the husband is gaining, whether it's halal or haram? Is that her business? That's okay. the second question. Two questions. Whenever a woman is having her menses, we say there are two different opinions. The vast majority of the fuqaha are of the view that she doesn't read Quran, she doesn't touch Quran, uh, she doesn't pray. And there are some of the scholars who, after investigating all the evidences, they say what is forbidden only touching the Qur'an with bare hands. But reciting Qur'an for women during their period is okay, especially if she is revising what she had memorized, if she's teaching Qur'an, or if she's a student and memorizing the Qur'an. So she has to do this on a regular basis. Does she have to make wudu? She doesn't have to make wudu. She's in the menses. But if she does, fine. But it is not required because she's already in the menses. Wudu with the menses will not lift any impurity, neither minor nor major. Uh, but never touch the Quran with bare hands while you are in a state of janaba, whether for a man or a woman. Is it incumbent on a woman to find out whether her husband's earning is lawful or not? If a woman knows that her husband is working for the government, alhamdulillah, no problem. Whenever a woman knows her husband's salary is a couple thousands, but he just purchased a BMW. Honey, where did you get this from? Because this is very suspicious. They moved to a nice house and he furnished it. A couple million dollars. You gotta tell me where did you get the money from? A friend of mine, and he is one of the best surgeons in the States. When he wanted to surprise his wife, he bought her a beautiful house. It was the best in town. So a doctor, and he's making very decent income, but she asked him, I said I took a loan from the bank. You know, okay, no big deal. She was attending the khutbah once when I was giving the Jumu'ah, and I spoke about Triba, and what Allah said about Triba. So she left from the masjid and she said to her husband, I'm not setting a foot in your house. Why not? You know, everybody dreams of the house. They take pictures in front of the house. People, they just come and take pictures in front of the house. This is in America. She said, no, this is from haram. He's not working in haram, but he took a loan. And she started telling him what she heard in the khutbah. And so the guy was not stubborn. The brother was a reasonable person and he too when he knew that this is something haram and he didn't know before or he didn't realize it is that haram he simply went and he exchanged his retirement plan and he paid fully for the house and he gave her the deed after he lost 
30% of the value of his uh, 401k because he didn't want to live in a place which there is haram in it, not due to earning, but because of the loan that he have taken to buy the house. Subhanallah, we have learned that our predecessors, the woman would uh, prepare her husband before leaving for work and give him a farewell and go by kiss and she says, honey, Abdullah, fear Allah, make sure that you do not provide us for us from unlawful sources because we can definitely bear hunger and thirst patiently but how can we bear the hellfire this is unbearable may allah guide us to what is best thank you respected sister assalamu alaikum rahmatullah barakatuh abu job from mauritania assalamu alaikum walaikum assalam Go ahead. I have a question regarding. Uh, I have a question regarding sales. I I manage a a Facebook group where people uh, post what they're selling. Yeah. And um, I was wondering. So so I was wondering, is it is it permissible to uh, to approve a post that has um, uh, handbags and and shoes uh, like luxurious shoes for for women or like uh, clothing. Is it, is it permissible? Before I answer you, why do you think that it may not be permissible? Because because uh, I see that um, this is not for, for, for uh, that this is not for indoor. It's like like handbag and it's, it's fancy. I, I, I do your, your and, wife. Uh, you you're married. Brother, you're married, right? Yes. Taib, Abu Job, when you're going out with your wife, doesn't she carry a handbag or she doesn't? Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not married, uh, Sheikh. Oh, in, inshallah, in the future when you get married, don't you see your <laughs> mom, your aunt, any, any woman she's going out, doesn't she carry a handbag? Look, my, my friend, I can easily say, yeah, it's halal, halal, halal. But, you know, I'm taking it easy on also other viewers in order to verify to them, you know, there must be a logic behind why do you think this is haram? A handbag, pair of shoes, uh, or even laundry. As long as they're not showing the showcase and women wearing the laundry, they say they're selling laundry. Is it halal for women to buy lingerie and to sell lingerie? You know, women wear lingerie. Men wear undergarments and underclothes and underwear. Is it halal to buy them and sell them? Yes, but it is not halal to display them or even in pictures while people wearing them. So selling these items and posting them, it is halal as long as you're not uh, showing in the images something haram or the item that is put for sale itself is haram. If it is permissible for a woman to wear a abaa, to carry a handbag, even if it is uh, worth a thousand dollar, it is a name brand, some people can afford it, no problem. You know, I do not judge people, how dare you buy a watch for 10,000? Because the person has a hundred million. So he likes watches. He is driving the best car, and it is worth a million or 1.5 million. MashaAllah, he is a multi-millionaire. He can afford that. This is none of your business. It becomes haram when I have to borrow or when I put myself and family in trouble in order to fulfill the shahwa of driving, you know, a nice car to show off. But you can afford it, fine. You can afford to live in Beverly Hills, fine. You can afford uh, to stay in five or seven star hotel. It's halal. Barakallah feek. Abu Job. Thank you, Akhi. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Muhammad from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan. Muhammad, how are, how are you? you? Alhamdulillah, Muhammad. I am good, I am good. Uh, okay, go ahead. I work like, like, six months for one company yeah 
after that I saw the you know the call is uh, the dildo that thing is it come like in one week sometime so I don't have uh, that much uh, experience uh, to get another job Muhammad, let me help you to rephrase your question. Sometimes when you are asking questions, especially live on air, it is best to avoid being specific. I work in a job where, Sheikh, I just realized that I end up selling something which is haram. So the job is halal, but this item and its selling is haram. Can you avoid selling this item? No, it's unavoidable. Then the job is haram. Uh, well, I don't have any other job. I have to, you know, pay the rent or feed myself. So you start immediately looking for another job, even if you work as a stock boy in a grocery store. But again, do not stock or do not uh, deal with something that is haram, like alcohol, like tobacco, like lotto ticket. Okay? So it is best, my dear viewers, if uh, the question is kind of embarrassing, to answer, to ask a general question, to say, I work in a place where I just discovered I'm selling something haram. What am I supposed to do? Look for another job which is halal. When you say I'm not experienced, and what kind of experience you have in packing and selling those items? No experience. So I'm sure you will find, inshallah, another job. When you trust Allah the Almighty and you trust Him, you yani understand that. He's got the keys of provision. He's the only provider. And he says, if you try to please Allah, if you leave what is forbidden in order to make Allah happy, then he says, Whoever fears Allah and keeps his duty to him, Allah will deliver him out of every hardship. And will secure for him better provision and risk from means which he could never anticipate nor imagine. All of us, my dear viewers, we need to be confident and have trust in Allah the Almighty that he never lets down his servants. He never forgets nor neglects those who sacrifice things for his sake. Rather, he will give them priority to bless them, to increase their provision, to compensate them for what they left for his sake. Because whoever abandons or gives up on anything for the sake of Allah because it is haram or disliked, most definitely the Almighty Allah will give him better than what he left for his sake. May the Almighty Allah grant us yaqeen in him, certainty, and enable us to put our trust properly انهم اقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Forgetting all about him in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price